Dave Zirin is the sports editor of The Nation, host of The Edge of Sports. He's got a podcast, hashtag, or no, at uh, Edge of Sports. And also, he's the author of the book Brazil's Dance with the Devil, the World Cup, the Olympics, and the Fight for Democracy. Boy, that sounds like a cheery story. Let's bring in Dave, who joins us now. Hi, Dave. Hi. Yeah, it's not the feel-good read of the season, but I still have some fun stories of like uh, trying to find the Michael Jackson statue in a favela and all kinds of other little first-hand explorer accounts of what Rio looks like today. Oh, great. Are you going to Rio? Yep, I will be there on August the 8th. Oh, good. Then uh, we'll have to cross paths over there. I hope so. I mean, I, I'm, I can't say I'm not a little bit nervous about what's happening there. My expectations are very uh, tremulous. I'll just say that. Your reaction to Michael Jordan's statements yesterday and his uh, donations were what? Like, I, I think it's so important that we identify the difference between uh, politics and philanthropy, because those are two different things. Because obviously it's amazing. Someone writes a $2 million check because they want the world to be a better place and they want to put their money where their mouth is. Good for them. But when I hear people say things like, Michael Jordan is breaking his political silence, as if this is Michael Jordan's version of Tommy Smith and John Carlos raising their fist in 68, or Muhammad Ali standing up against the war in Vietnam. I mean, this is just a different category of action. It's sort of like, like, getting a wonderful plate of fish and being like, this is the best steak I ever had. I mean, it's fine, but it, but we should not confuse it with a political action. But it's a start though. At least we're, we're talking. I, I don't know. Are we, are we expecting more though? Because we haven't heard anything from Jordan from for 30 years. Is that why maybe we're giving him more credit than he deserves? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, this was like when Terrence Malick started to make movies again, and nobody took a second to ask whether the, the thin red line was actually any good or not. They were just so happy he was back behind the camera. Uh, I mean, and, and I think that that's uh, similar to this, is that we're grading this on a big curve. Because think about what Jordan is doing. Like, he's not, I mean, to me, politics, whether you agree with pol- the politics or disagree with the politics, inherent in that question is whether or not the person is actually taking a side and fighting for something. And what Jordan is doing explicitly is he's trying to build a bridge, build a bridge between two communities and have a more peaceful status quo between police and the African-American community. And there are all sorts of organizations, if he'd wanted to be political, that he could have given his money to that are taking a side on this, from from Black Lives Matter to Hands Up United, BYP. Uh, These organizations are are springing up all over the country of people who are fighting actively for police reform. Not police understanding, but police reform. So we're talking about just two very different things. And yeah, I absolutely um, think that we're grading this on a curve, because when it comes to Michael Jordan, our only expectation at this point in this man's public life, it really is silence. What impact do you think Muhammad Ali's death had on any of these athletes? Oh, that's a great question, and I actually think it, it had something profound. And this is really interesting to me, because when Ali passed away, my first instinct as somebody who's been writing about Ali, who's known many members of his, of his inner circle, and, and all, all of this, like, deep connection I feel towards Ali and his legacy, like... My first reaction was like, well, I wonder if this will just lead to a sense of relief because he has been so incapacitated for 20 years and whatnot that maybe this is just a gentle way to say goodbye at because he's really been gone for so long. But then when I went to Louisville for the funeral and I stood among the hundreds of thousands of people who were throwing flowers at his car as it went down Main Street in Louisville and as I spoke to so many ordinary folks in Louisville who met him and then spoke to other folks who knew Ali so well, who were there for the services that day, I, I realized that I was completely wrong. And the mere fact of Ali leaving this earth seemed to shift people in a way to be like, okay, you know, we, and it was almost like the opposite of what I thought it would be. Like almost like Ali being in this sort of suspended animation of Parkinson's disease almost had people say like, well, there's Ali. He's still with us. But then the absence of Muhammad Ali from this planet the idea that Muhammad Ali no longer walks among us, the idea of that chain, that link being broken, um, I I really do think it shifted people to say, well, someone better pick up this torch or else it's just going to die. And I felt that in Louisville, and I think that really did have had an effect on our general atmosphere. So 
it, I would be remiss to not think it had some effect on Michael Jordan. And then you had LeBron and uh, Carmelo. You had Dwayne Wade and uh, Chris Paul. At and the, you had the LeBron Espies. explicitly mentioned. Yeah, and you had LeBron ex- explicitly mentioned Muhammad Ali, where and, and, and explicitly speak about that idea of picking up the torch. And you know, the torch, of course, has that, that bigger meaning of Muhammad Ali too, because of the courage of. And, and I got to tell you, Dan, I'm sure you talked about this on your show when Ali passed, but I feel like this has gotten undersold because when I speak to disability rights activists, the courage of Muhammad Ali in 1996 to be public with his Parkinson's when he held that torch. Because I think in this era of social media where so many people blessedly, blessedly are public about whatever their, their disabilities or challenges might be, we've become a little bit uh, calloused to the idea that people were not really public about those things as recently as 1996. And I've spoken to so many people since Ali died who work on disability rights issues who just said the sight of him shaking and holding that torch was a life-changing moment for them of saying, I don't have to be ashamed. And I, I really do feel like this idea of passing the torch with Ali, it has that kind of power where people don't only think of the 1960s, but they think of the 1990s, which, of course, is much more recent. So Ali, when he finally leaves his mortal coil and goes to the other side, People see that and say, my goodness, uh, we have some work to do to make sure this legacy doesn't die. He's Dave Zirin, the uh, sports editor of The Nation, joining us, Dan Patrick Show. I also wonder about Michael Jordan, uh, maybe Tiger Woods, uh, some of these other athletes who look at Ali and the legacy that he left was, was not necessarily about boxing. It was about Ali, the person. So you can have all mm-hmm. the accolades and yet you can have all the money. But what do you really have when you leave or when, you know, when people remember you? And I don't know if that impacts yeah. Jordan or Tiger or Carmelo or LeBron, but it feels like there's well, a, a little bit of a shift, not a seismic one, but at least a little bit of a shift here. Well, I've heard two things about that. That's a great question. The first thing is that I think this has affected LeBron since the day he came into the league. Like I found this interview with LeBron from either his first or second year in the NBA where he said he had two goals as an NBA player. One was to be the wealthiest athlete to ever live, and the other was, as he put it, and these are LeBron's words, a global icon like Muhammad Ali. Mm-hmm. So from the very beginning, LeBron had this idea that this has to be more about, about be about more than sneaker sales. This has to be about more than championships. One may be a venue to the other, to that kind of icon status, but you also kind of have to stand for something. The second thing is, and I have no idea if this affected Jordan at all, but I've been thinking a lot since Ali's passing about uh, your, your old boss. So your old boss is over at ESPN, your old company there, and when they did the Athletes of the Century in 2000. And you remember at that time, you know, Jordan, you know, the memory of the shot over Brian Russell was still in everybody's mind, and everybody was still, like, in the thrall of the Jordan myth and how Jordan was number one and mm-hmm. Ali was number two of Athletes of the Century. And some of us squawked about that, but at the same time, Michael Jordan was so unassailable. What else could you do? I think if that same vote was taken today, there's just no question that Ali would be number one. Because Jordan's legend has faded, but Ali's legend has only gotten bigger no. with the years. And it's hard to imagine somebody like Michael Jordan would not pay attention to that fact about how their relative legends are being burnished with time. Yeah, we could have a good discussion. I think the uh, number one athlete on that list uh, should have been Jackie Robinson, not even close with, uh, yeah. you know. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think your old buddy Keith argued the same thing, and I think it's, it's a very, very correct argument. I think that's a very defensible argument, definitely. Well, yeah, if you look at just athletically, basketball, football, track, uh baseball at UCLA, uh, the impact that he had, uh, you know, that pretty, it took a little while for me to understand all of it because I was the host of that. I, I remember doing that and, and you're trying to go, okay, wait a minute, where's secretariat in there? Wait, secretariat's in this? Wait, okay. George, I, it was so important to people. Tim Duncan, after the NBA finals, when they won, as we're getting ready to go on sports center, the Spurs had just won the title in the garden. He goes, all right, so who's number one on the list? He, that was the first thing he asked me when he came into our little interview room at, uh, at ESPN when we were at the Garden. So I'm like, <laughs> it, it, I mean, it resonated with people, and it might still resonate with Michael Jordan. I think you bring up a great point. Let me ask you the poll question before I uh, let you go back Just, to your vacation. Oh boy, I guess, guys, that, 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 that sports entry, that might have been the first story to go viral before social media. Yeah, 
Yeah, everybody had a top. Everybody had an opinion on mm-hmm. it, <laughs> and I remember it was getting Twitter yelled at before there was Twitter. Yeah, I I remember guys who were like, "How can you put a horse in there?" I go, "I didn't put the horse in there. <laughs> I, I just read the script here. I'm a talking hairdo. All right, leave me alone." <laughs> McLovin, give Dave the uh, poll question here in the final minute. Should the NFL continue to test for marijuana? Uh, no, absurd. Um, people have the right to mitigate their own pain. It's already legal in several states. And when players go the illegal route for marijuana, you're much more likely to get a dangerous strain. Much rather have it be legal, above board, and mild for players who are mitigating the, just the life of living in the NFL. The only problem I have, Dave, is how can the commissioner say that and not, I mean, how do you present it where you're, you're not signing off on marijuana use as much as you just want to ease the testing on marijuana use sort of behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, I heard someone else make this point, so I don't want to pass this away as an original idea, but I can't remember who said it. But they could also do something, and maybe it's not the most courageous move in the world, but they could do something where they, they say it's against the rules, but they stop testing for it. Not unlike what they did with so many years for steroids. Where yeah. like you're not allowed to take steroids, but they didn't test for it. That might be a way to, it might be too cute by half in the 21st century, but it also might be a way to handle that problem. Dave, always great to talk to you. Thank you. My privilege, everybody. That's uh, Dave Zirin, the sports editor of The Nation, host of The Edge of Sports, also the author of the uh, cheery book, Brazil's Dance with the Devil, the World Cup, the Olympics, and the Fight for Democracy. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.